Silicon Valley Future Forum. Anil Leerla, Head of Information and Analytics at Global IS Visa. Um, my team applies AI and machine learning for cybersecurity and risk management. Okay, so we have a broad range of, uh, of uh, interests and perspectives. So what's happening um, in your space? Uh, where are you now? And what your, what's your perspective as to what's going to happen um, over the next year and how will it affect our lives? So. Oh, I picked first. Um, so DeepMap makes um, so-called high-definition maps for self-driving cars. And we, we use deep learning almost every aspect of our um, software stack. Um, in particular, um, since self-driving cars needs very detailed information about our physical world, so our challenge is that we need to uh, literally recreate a virtual 3D representation of what we actually see in the, in the world. And as part of that process, we need to use um, AI to do a lot of object detection and 3D reconstruction so that we can recreate um, a pristine 3D representation of the world while, we're re while we remove a lot of the, what we call temporal objects, like cars, people walking on the streets, cats and dogs, and so on. So, so where, where is that now, and where will it be in the year? What are, you, what are you seeing as the challenges, and how's that growing? Right, so right now, actually, we have a booth outside. Uh, people are welcome to walk over and take a look at our demos at a, a deep map booth. Um, we are able to do a lot of the uh, 3D reconstruction very, very well today. Um, for instance, we take a, um, a car with some cameras and then one LiDAR sensor. We're able to scan the road and recreate that 3D environment. Um, a year from now, um, we'll be still probably working a lot on improving the precision of our maps. And a major challenge for us is not only to recreate the 3D world, but we also want to be able to understand the 3D world. So we want to know where the stop signs are, um, where the yield, uh, yield signs are, what are the traffic rules, where people are allowed to make U-turns. If they are, during certain hours, um, you know, they, they may not be allowed to. And we need to build a lot of these semantic or knowledge information about the world in the next 12 months. Thank you. So, so you went live today. Yes, in America. Um, so, so where is it at, and, and what, what do you what do you see as a challenge in, in launching? Um, the, the challenge um, wasn't so much in launching; it was in what is different about Bigsby. And Bigsby is not merely a conversational agent. Um, it's a it's it's it's, it's a it's the first nail in the ground, stake in the ground to move what's now a primarily GUI-based user experience to a VUI-based voice user experience um, user journey. So with that, Bigsby's, it's a, it's a tall order, one which I, th I think everyone is going to find we accomplished very well, um, and it'll only get better with time. Um, you can control any touch-based command you can, can, you'll be able to control with voice command. So rather than having to, to click through a tedious regimen of UI actions to go through apps or to just find music or to go hail an Uber, you'll be able to go through a multitude of screens just by one, with, 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 one, with one command, um, which alleviates quite a bit of Again, daunting and tedious and, and, and cumbersome flipping through AI, flipping through UI screens all day. And um, I think that uh, this, is the, uh, this is a very complete and total step in that direction. Um, as there is the, the, the graphic user interface is now going to just complement the primarily voice-based user experience. Um, and uh, Obviously, Bigsby and other um, conversational AI agents are, are doing their own thing to, to, to propel that forward. But uh, this is a very total step in uh, the direction of what's going to be the future of user experience, of integrating with AI and collaborating with AI and machines. So, so why is voice? Uh, why, why voice now? 
why, why, is, how, why is this coming to a, a fore now and, and what will be different in a year? Well, the technology is fermented um, more so than it has and the, the pace of innovation is exponentially faster than, than it really ever has been. So with natural language understanding and, 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 and NLG and NLP in, in general becoming um, more capable and hardware becoming um, compute power becoming being able to 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 handle that that task that task load um, it's 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 set because touch screens multi touch screens have sort of come and gone um, where I think we all envisioned to be um, in the decades prior touch screens are, are sort of uh, archaic in, in where what we envisioned as the future so now it's time to, to it's, it, that, that paradigm's set, and now it's time to move ahead and progress forward, um, where, again, the, uh, the, voice, you, the voice is the, is the primary user experience. The graphics are only going to supplement it, rather than being completely a, a, a graphical experience. Does this mean I'll be able to give up carrying my, my clunky phone and I'll, it'll all be through my watch, or, or what does this mean? It's the beginning of that. It's, it's the beginning of it, and of course, data, user data, and um, use cases have to be conceived and derived out of, it's gonna be a sequential process, but yes, essentially, you're, I mean, if, for, for something like AR, like a, for example, let's use AR, if you're going to have a, a, a visor in front of you that is um, putting if you're gonna have a mixed reality environment with whatever hardware you're using, it's not going to be something you really wanna control. I mean, obviously you can't touch it because um, you're gonna be poking at your eye, so that would, that's not really viable. Um, so how to engage with technology, it's gonna be conducive, especially at the scale of things that are emerging like VR and AR. You're gonna to want to definitely have a much speedy, more seamless, and more natural um, way of engaging with it than, than poking at a screen, so. Great, thanks. So you're doing, uh, you're doing uh, chatbots for customer service. Yeah. Um, are you integrating voice yet? No. No, okay. No. Um, where, where, where are you at today and where will you be? Uh, in a in year. year. Um, okay, well, so today we have, uh, we run our bots when we're developing against, uh, I don't know if you've all heard of the Turing test, um, this imitation game proposed by Alan Turing, where the idea is basically, um, if an artificial intelligence is sufficiently uh, advanced, it ought to be able to trick a human observer into thinking that it's a person. Um, this is obviously a, 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 a very difficult challenge uh, in a text-only environment. And when you move to voice, you add a whole layer of complexity because suddenly natural language synthesis becomes another blocking uh, component. Um, but where we are today is uh, in the domain of customer service, uh, we can pass the Turing test about 70% of the time. Um, and that's been really, really, uh, really interesting to watch. I mean, you learn a bunch of really interesting things about kind of the human condition by interacting with, uh, with people who have then interacted with your AI. Like, uh, when people first interact with this system, if they don't realize that it's a machine, you get all sorts of strange things that you would never see from a machine. Like, uh, oh, thanks so much. Uh, I hope you have a really great weekend. Like, when have you ever said that to your cell phone? I hope you have a really great weekend. Um, but when that human interaction is there, the emotional connection starts to come up, and that's, uh, that's been proving very valuable for, uh, for customer support. Um, but to, to get back to the bigger question, because I, I think that was really kind of fun, like where is AI now and where is it going? Yep. Um, so I think a year is too short of a time scale. I think okay. as, as with all of these things, uh, we overestimate what's gonna happen in a year, and we wildly underestimate what's happening in 10 years. Um, I think in a year, things will look pretty similar. Uh, I think what's happening now is uh, some things in natural language like machine reading tasks where you give a computer a paragraph of text and you ask it a question about the text and it's able to pick out the answer. Those are just now starting to work. And it'll take a couple of years before that really progresses to the point where it's, uh, 
it's really seamless. You know, it's really Jarvis. Because uh, we've always want, I mean, this is the dream, right? Like, Jarvis would be awesome. Um, yeah, so, so I think uh, if we adjust the question and say 10 years, I think where we are in 10 years is uh, we will have natural language interfaces to everything. Screens will be uh, only useful for visual editing activities, and most of those will probably be augmented reality. Um, and language interfaces will blow you away. I mean, they're, they're getting better and better every year, and uh, in a decade, I, I think that it will be uh, hard to distinguish them from um, human beings. So uh, where are we today with, um, with using this uh, for customer service? Are people literally replacing their whole customer service teams? No. W will, we see, no. will we see that uh, evolution and change in jobs? How is that affecting industry? So, um, so, so I think the, the way to think about this is uh, AI is constrained by what you can already do with the information technology systems in an enterprise. So if you don't have an API for uh, canceling a customer's order, there's no way an AI is going to be able to do that, no matter how good the language technology is. Right? The language technology is effectively an interface that replaces something like a web browsing experience um, and lets you kind of uh, plug directly into that. Um, and so the only tasks that the AI can actually fully accomplish for customers are things that you already have uh, integration points for, which means the more complicated stuff like, uh, hey, your computer seems to uh, think that my package was delivered, but it's not here. Um, there's no way for the AI to solve that because it is itself a computer who thinks that the package has been delivered. <laughs> and so there's a, uh, there's a bit of a cyclical issue there. So, so it's really for handling the, uh, the kind of first line of defense, like the 80% of, of conversations that are really rote, really simple, repetitive, and then kind of there's that 20% that you still need humans for. Thanks. Yeah. So I have a different perspective from the enterprise side. Um, instead of talking about where we are now, I would say like last four years, the journey started with statistical modeling, then we got into a little bit of machine learning, the compute storage and network have become, you know, evolved quite a bit in the last few years, so now we do deep learning, right? Having said that, I mean, still defining the use cases, what problem you're trying to solve is definitely important. And then the heuristics, right? I mean, just because you build a model, doesn't the journey doesn't end there. You gotta spend a lot of time operationalizing it and using it and tuning it further so that you could reap value. And where it's going, uh, I think we're just getting started. Uh, most business models would be disrupted, right? We are changing the way we, you know, work. So from that point of view, possibilities are unlimited. I guess it'll, it'll be interesting to see how things evolve in the ent enterprise space and how people are applying these emerging technologies to create value. At the end of the day, it's about you know um, looking at audio to figure out the sentiment analysis. And that's what we're trying to do here. At the end, it's not about the technology, but it's about making the customer experience frictionless. And that part of the things will get better and better. So where do you see the where do you see this the points where it's failing right now? You still need to have good quality data, right? Just because you have a lot of volume of data doesn't mean that you're able to solve a lot of different problems. One, from the enterprise space, um, sure, in the valley here things move fast, but the technology landscape has to you know adapt, right? People are still talking about you know, DB2s and rest of the old data technologies. Those need to evolve then you have to gather the right kind of data, then you apply you know, right use cases on that to reap value. So where are, we, where are you seeing the growth in the uh, customer base in this? Where, do you, where, 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 is the, where are those growing markets? It's several, like, closer to my heart is like cybersecurity and risk management. On one side, you know, there's a lot of innovation that's going on, which is driving good amount of value creation and growth. On the other side, the sophistication of the attacks become very, very complicated, right? So you have to catch up with that. But in terms of uh, the growth, obviously customer service definitely is a very you know, low hanging fruit, right? That's where most people are talking about. Then there is autonomous driving and so on and so forth. So what about you? Where are you seeing the, the growth in the markets? So, um I guess I think about the deployment of uh, 
artificial intelligence a little bit differently than I think most people do. I think it will actually have a much larger impact than just going in and kind of making business processes a little bit more efficient. Um, I think broadly speaking, uh, and this is, this, this claim needs to be bracketed a little bit, but broadly speaking, we already see the form that artificial superintelligence is going to take. Um, and I think as that kind of expands and becomes uh, more useful, it's, it's really going to change a lot of things. But okay, so I, I, need, to, I need to really uh, define what I mean by that so I don't sound like a crazy person. Um, I think uh, when you break down artificial intelligence systems that are deployed today, what you have is a model of the universe or some subset of the universe that you want to interact with and an optimization method and a utility function. So what you're saying is, hey, I think the universe works this way, right? Like I have this map of the street. Um, I have a utility function. I want to get this person from point A to point B. I have a set of actions I can take in the universe like steering the car and uh, applying the accelerator and the brake. Um, and what you find is optimizers, that, that, that set of uh, algorithms that you can kind of hand this pair of things to, say here's a model of the world and what I want to have happen. Those are already getting so good that they're, uh, we can't explain why they work so well as human beings. Um, we can use them. We've experimented and found ones that work really well. Uh, neural nets work really well. Reinforcement learning on neural nets seems to be working in some cases uh, really well. Um, but, but we have these kind of, this, this central challenge is build me a model and find me a utility function to optimize that model. Um, I think with, uh, with enterprises, as, as, as this starts to expand, what we're going to see is uh, less and less of the decision making around the enterprise being made by human beings and more of, more of it being uh, the human beings are in charge of setting the parameters of the model and the utility function. They're saying, here's how my business works. I know that if I do this, this other thing usually happens. And here's a bunch of data to back that up. Now, computer, figure out how to price my offerings, where to send my advertisements, uh, how to handle customer support, how to handle uh, my, my financial risk management and all of these things. Um, and we're already seeing that starting to happen, but I think what you're going to see in 10 years is uh, everyone who hasn't done that yet is dead, and the people who are doing that have embraced it wholeheartedly. And uh, the, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that will, it'll be invisible to us, but the change will be, will be very substantial. So, so what about you? Where do you see the opening markets? I mean, everyone's really, um, there's a visceral interest in, in chatbots and, and, and virtual assistants. Um, and in some cases, it's warranted. In a lot of cases, it's just for the sake of having them. For, so for example, like a company may not understand what the benefits are, what pain points they're trying to alleviate with them. They just want them for the sake of having a chatbot answer. So they understand it. They're aware of it on a very surface level. I see. Um, awareness and, um, and, and, and um, a, a rounding and a, a affirming of the practice of and the benefits of having like a, so, so essentially like a list of it's, it's hard to answer as far as where it's, it's, it's growing because because the growth may not be necessarily um, contingent on deployment and true end use. Like, like a company may not actually see it through or, or create something like a chatbot for um, the right reason or to address the right areas of their business. Um, but what I see is really the, the methods being refined. OpenAI has a really cool um, recently published uh, research paper about goal-driven uh, language understanding, and it's these, it's 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 these, it's these forward leaps in addressing the fact that the language aspect, the dialogue, is such a minor part of it. Um, but a lot of companies, when they're creating chatbots or virtual assistants, I, I see it more and more frequently, are hiring like copywriters, and that's like hiring a mechanic if they, based on the fact that they can hold like a hammer and a nail. It's, it's just a very, it's, it's one, it's a, it's a vital piece, but it's a very small piece 
of the overall picture. So I'm hoping to see that where the growth is really is on the end of, of, of the industry understanding and the other industries adopting AI, understanding where, what the benefits are of virtual assistants, but then also require, developing and acquiring the correct talent who have machine learning understanding, but also have front end and user experience understanding and have the entire plethora of every aspect that goes into making like a virtual assistant and humor inter interfacing AI. So I, I'm hoping that essential, that basically that the industry, that everyone, the growth is more of a, an education and awareness. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I guess I have um, also maybe a different perspective um, on the next 10 years of growth of AI, um, mainly because I come from the uh, self-driving industry. Um, this is where people use AI to literally make life and death decisions. And the tolerance for error is pretty much zero. Um, because if a machine makes a wrong decision, it not only impacts the, um, the uh, safety of the passengers in the car, it potentially also impacts other drivers on the road as well. Um, so from that perspective, uh, we are constantly worried about limitations of AI. Um, and maybe I'll give you a few examples here. Um, so even though there's very, uh, uh, there is a lot of excitement about the potential of AI, one thing people don't tend to think about is that the AI is only as good as the data you give it. Good AIs are built on mountains and mountains of high quality data. And collecting and validating all this high quality data in itself is actually a tremendous challenge. Um, this is true for natural language learning. This is true for self-driving. This is true for making maps for self-driving as well. And as part of our exercise, obviously, we need to collect mountains and mountains of data all over the world. We um, need to look at all the different road types in US, in Germany, in Japan, in China, so on and so forth. So that's one challenge when it comes to um, the development of AI. The other big challenge in AI uh, right now uh, that I don't see a solution, maybe other people have ideas, is that people tend to think that AI is very smart and is able to do everything, but in reality, it's just the opposite. AIs uh, or machine or models are tend to be trained to do very specific things. Um, AlphaGo is a good example. If you take AlphaGo algorithm and let it ask you to play chess, you'll probably fail very miserably. Uh, the model actually needs to be retrained. Same thing happens for many other um, domains as well. So this is a challenge I see. Um, again, for self-driving, there's no single challenge that a self-driving car has, has to solve. It needs to solve a whole um, range of very complex problems. So we don't know the answer, um, but this is just uh, a thing that we need to be aware of in this particular space. Um, another challenge for AI in general is that it's oftentimes very hard to interpret why AI is behaving a certain way, right? Um, I think one of the panelists mentioned that earlier. You know, we know that AlphaGo plays really well and then wins um, uh, all the ch uh, competition that they entered, but it's very hard to interpret why the machine behaved or made certain moves. Um, another example is that DeepMind recently, you know, announced that they train their machine to, or train, train their models to teach, um, or teach the machine how to learn to walk. And if you haven't seen the videos, I highly recommend it. One of the way, or one of the modules, or the model that looked more like a human, learned to walk and then climb over obstacles and so on, but it was always sticking one of the arm up. Nobody knows why, right? Every other part of the body was doing the right thing, except that right arm. Um, again, this is probably okay for a certain domain, um, but it's very challenging for self-driving because of the safety concern. We need to be able to understand not only, um, we, need not, we not only need to know that models work well, we also need to understand why it works well and why it fails in some cases. Thank you very much. We are uh, being waived at a, a time. Uh, I'd like to thank my, uh, thank you for coming and thank the, my panel. Thank you. Thank you. Silicon Valley Future Forum.